Welcome everyone to our weekly overview of our daily growth book. This week we are looking at 1 John chapters 1 and 2. My name is Mike and I'm looking forward to diving into this with you today. Uh, these two chapters have so much truth in them. I'm actually not even sure what we're going to share today because there's too much for me to cover in this short video. But I pray that as you read and dive into these scriptures, the Holy Spirit will illuminate things to you and allow you to be changed forever. Uh, let's look at this book, the book of 1 John. Now, John uh, obviously is the disciple whom Jesus loved. He identifies himself that way in John chapter 13, verses, uh, verse 23. He was a man who has walked and talked with Jesus. He saw him heal, he heard him teach, he watched him die, he met him in his resurrected form, and he saw him ascend. John does not personally identify himself in his letters as formally as Paul or other authors of the New Testament. Instead, he, we must glean his identity from different statements made by him or about him throughout the Bible. Perhaps the most important statement he ever makes about himself is found in this Gospel of John where he says he's the disciple uh, Jesus loved who was sitting next to Jesus at the table. So other translations here say that John was leaning or reclining on Jesus' bosom, which led many artists to draw up the Last Supper, depicting John leaning into Jesus very closely. I love this idea of John being so intimate and close with Jesus. And John knew that Jesus loved him. He described that as a part of his character, but a part of who he was, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, why is that so important? Well, he had a real living, personal, active relationship with Jesus. And as we will see throughout this book, those who know how much they are loved are able to love much. That's one of the messages of 1 John. So this book was written in around 85 or 90, somewhere in that five-year time frame, 90 AD, prior to his exile. So prior to John being sent to the Isle of Patmos, where he would write the book of Revelation, which most of us are familiar with. He would have been quite old, 79 to 84 years old at the time of writing, and most likely living and primarily engaged in ministry in the region of Ephesus in modern-day Turkey. He and most of the New Testament church had been forced to flee Jerusalem in around 70 AD when the Romans completely destroyed the Jewish temple and were severely persecuting both Jewish and Christian believers. At this time, Christianity had been growing for more than a generation. Believers who had never met Christ personally were now filling up the churches and correspondingly false teachings about who Jesus really was or is were beginning to arise. In particular, there was a group known as the Gnostics who were claiming that Jesus had never truly walked the earth in bodily form because a body in and of itself is evil. There was another group that was claiming that he never had a body because he was just a spirit that walked on the earth and never even left a footprint. So these two heresies have arisen, and John writes to the New Testament church, the church as a whole, to remind us that Jesus is a real person who we can have a real living relationship with. So one of the primary purposes of his book is to address those heresies and John chooses his words very carefully. He wants his readers to know that Jesus really existed in the flesh and he knew him personally. John does not write this book to a specific individual like he does in 3 John or to a specific church like he does in 2 John, but rather to the church as a whole. He writes to all believers everywhere to reassure them in their faith, dispel doubts, and build assurance by presenting a clear picture of who Jesus is. He also writes to invite both new and mature believers into a deeper, tangible relationship with God. If I had to sum up the entire book of 1 John, I would say it is an invitation to know Jesus personally. And I love this, love this book. Now, let's look at 1 John 1. Uh, we're going to go through 1 John chapter 1 and chapter 2, but I'm going to try to go through all these verses as quickly as I can. I pray that God will help us accomplish this mission. So, verse 1, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him and now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then He was revealed to us. Great 
amazing opening to this. And actually, the first four verses of this book in the original Greek are all one long run-on run sentence. So I stopped, I paused here just for a moment to say, John is saying, this is a real person that I knew, that I've heard, that I've seen, and he is life. He is life itself. The word life is the Greek word zoe. It means the absolute fullness of life that belongs to God. A happy life now filled with every kind of blessing and eternal life and the hope thereof. It also can mean a real, genuine, active, and vigorous life devoted to God both now and forever. I love this word. This is how John first and primarily wants us to understand and interact with Jesus. Jesus is life. He's eternal life. He's the word of life. And in knowing him and in knowing that life, our lives can be changed, can become more full, can be more uh, fulfilled. They can be uh, something they could never be without him, right? So John is introducing us to Jesus as life. And now in verse three and four, we proclaim to you that we that, excuse me, we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. I love this word fellowship. It actually means communion, joint participation, intercourse, or intimacy. In other words, this is talking about a close intimate friendship, a deep and abiding connection with God and with His Son. And John is inviting us into that relationship. And he says, guess what? When you walk into this fellowship, when you engage in this relationship, you will find not only the life that John just described, but you'll find joy. And joy, a simple definition of joy is joy, but it's cheerfulness, calm delight, gladness, great or exceeding joy. So John's talking about a joy that the world can't offer. He's talking about a joy that can only be found in the life with Jesus, the life of Jesus, right? So the true life, the life that is Jesus always comes with joy. Let's keep going. Verses 5 through 7. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Again, every one of these verses could be a sermon in and of itself. But John here couple of key words I want to kind of focus on. John talking about Jesus as the light. God is light. Light is used here of truth and its knowledge together with a spiritual purity associated with it, right? Now, there's very few things that you could say God is. God is love. God is light. And light is one of the ones that they've chosen more than once because of the ethereal quality, because of its purity, because of its um, intangible nature, but its very real impact on things around us, right? And that's a really good picture of what God can do and what Jesus can do is he has an impact on our lives even though we may not see him all the time. And so that's a great illustration with light. But also light does a couple things. Light brings truth. Light brings purity. And how does, it, how does it do that? Well, first, what is truth? Truth is, and what, what John's talking about when he says truth here, practicing the truth, um, he's talking about what is true in any matter under consideration. He's talking about everything as it really is, reality, certainty. So he's talking about truth, objective truth. Now, I know we live in a world today where everyone wants us to believe there is no truth, that truth is defined by an individual or a group of people or your emotions or your feelings. And even when it comes to things as complicated as gender now, that there's no right or wrong. And I just want you to know that's not, the, that's not what John believed. That's not what the Bible talks about. The Bible makes it clear that there is an objective truth. There's a right and wrong. There's light versus darkness. There's life versus death. There is a black versus white. There's no gray areas with truth. Truth is what it really is. It is what is true under any matter under consideration. It's objective. And this objective truth that is unchangeable is what Jesus brings to the table. This is the light that, that John is talking about. Jesus is the light who brings truth, who brings purity. Now look at purity because he's talking about being cleansed in verse 7. Cleanses is another Greek word that means to cleanse, purge, or purify, right? So light always comes with two things, truth and purity. Truth and purity. So what does that mean? It means the true light, the light that is Jesus, 
both reveals, shows us the truth, and cleanses. I love that about God. And this is something, a theme you find all through Scripture. God never shows us something that He doesn't want to help us change, right? If He's revealing something, if He's showing us something that, that's not right, that needs to be adjusted in our life, He's not going to leave us there. He also gives us the power to change. He gives us the purity. He, gives the, he brings His Spirit to bear on those things and His light to bear so that there is change in those areas. So truth and purity go hand in hand. Let's continue looking at verse uh, 8 through 10. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. That's a verse you should memorize. <laughs> if we claim we have not sinned, then we are, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Quote from Charles Spurgeon that really makes this a simple uh, this text just means this, that God, treat God truthfully and he will treat you truthfully. Make no pretensions before God, but lay bare your soul. Let him see it as it is, and then he will be faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Wow, powerful. What is Charles Spurgeon saying? What is this verse saying? It's saying we can't pretend that we have it all together. We cannot act like our mistakes were just small or that we've made uh, just a few missteps. We actually have to be very clear about the fact that we failed, that we are sinners and we are in need of a Savior. And if we walk in pride and try to protect ourselves from the truth of being less than what God's really wanting us to be, Romans 3.23, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. If we try to stay in that place where we pretend that nothing's wrong, we're actually, John identifies us as liars. We're not walking in the truth. And this is the thing. Why is that so important? Why is it important for us to admit that we're sinners? Because the Bible says that Jesus came to save sinners. He didn't come to save people that are saying, I kind of messed up. He came to save people that know I need a savior. And if you don't know that you need a savior, you're in a dangerous place because none of us is able to live up to the glorious standard that God has for us, the life that He wants us to live without the power and the presence of Jesus in our lives. And so this is the invitation. Come to know Jesus, admit your sins, admit your need for Him, and walk in relationship with Him. Experience the life, the joy, the truth, the light that comes from it, and, and, and experience a life that you've always longed to experience. So let's continue. This is chapter 2. This talks more about how Jesus really helps us, how he cleanses us, how that purity from this light happens in our lives. First, uh, first verse here in chapter 2. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is a sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. First verse makes it very clear. Look, John is saying Jesus will forgive. It just requires that we confess, that we admit we need him, and he will come and he will forgive us every time. But he's also saying don't treat that like a license. Don't treat, like, treat that like it's a pass to sin and live however you want because that's not what this is all about. Anybody that truly knows Jesus and truly uh, wants to live in relationship with him has to understand that there's a way to live that keeps us in close fellowship with him, that keeps him, in, keeps us in intimate friendship with him. And there's a way that draws, creates distance and draws us away from him. And so he's saying, don't sin, don't continue to walk away from this relationship, but stay close to him. And this confession, I want to say, I, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Confession is not what saves us. But it's what keeps us in close fellowship with Him. What saves us is very simple. It's the sacrifice of Jesus. And that's what this verse talks about in where it says the sacrifice that atones, a big fancy King James version of that word is the propitiation. It's a noun that means that which satisfies the demand, the reparation or amends for a wrong or injury. Now, just to bring it back to the gospel, Romans 3.23 says we've all sinned. Romans 6.23 says that uh, the wages of sin is death. That means that every single person in the world is under a death sentence. We deserve death. We've committed sins. We've fallen short. And we are headed to an eternal separation from God in hell. But Jesus has stepped into that. 
and he's paid the price. The way he did that was he died a sinner's death, though he didn't deserve it. He died the death that we deserved. He took the punishment that we deserved, that wages that we just described, so that we could be free, so that we could experience a true, living, life-giving relationship with him and with the Father. And so that's the gospel, and that's what John is inviting us to right here in this passage. Let's keep going to verse 3 and ver- uh, through, through 6. Excuse me. Let's go to verse 3. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is, that is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Really amazing passage. This is probably uh, worth studying for for more than just a few minutes, but I'll just go on to this. This is how we can be sure that we belong to Jesus. I know sometimes, uh, especially in your early walk with the Lord, you can feel like, am I even saved? You know, I'm still recognizing maybe that light of Jesus is revealing some things in your life that you don't like about yourself, some impatience, some anger issues, some lust issues. Um, maybe you just recognize there's some addict- addiction issues in your life and you're thinking, man, am I even saved? And this is one of the things that John wants to address. Hey, when you're addressing sin, when you're recognizing sin and you're confessing it, you don't have to worry because this is how we know if we are walking with Jesus. There's an assurance for those that are willing to do what he says and live as he did. So he's our standard. He's our example. He's the one that we want to emulate. And he's also given us some clear commandments about how we're supposed to do that. Look at verses 7 and 8 in this chapter. Dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one you have had from the very beginning. This old commandment to love one another is the same message you heard before, yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you are also, and you also are living it, for the darkness is disappearing, the true light is already shining. Now, actually, a little little later in this book, John gives us a very simple uh, explanation of what Jesus commands in John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. So I'm skipping ahead a smidge, but just want to read this because it gives us a simple understanding of what Jesus commands. And this is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us, right? This goes back to, if you remember from the gospel, someone asked Jesus, what's the most important commandment? The first is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it to love your neighbor as yourself. So this is what Jesus is reiterating here and what John reiterates in 1 John 3, 23. It's knowing and believing in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and loving one another just as he commanded us, right? Super powerful and it's attainable. This is something I want you to know that God never asks us to do something that He will not empower us to do, right? This is talked about throughout the Bible in multiple places, Philippians 2.13 for one. But just know that when God asks us to do something or commands us to do something, He never leaves us to figure it out on our own. He walks with us. He gives us the power to do it. And this is what He's asking us to do. Believe and love. Believe and love. Believe in Jesus and love each other. That's what God wants us to do. So let's go on to verses 9 through 11. Uh, If anyone claims, I am living in the light, but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. And anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. Now, a couple things could be said about this a lot, but I'll just say this. Christian love is, a, is not a feeling. It's a choice. Christian love is not a feeling. It's a choice. And this is what John's speaking of in 1 John chapter 2, 9 and 11. I love to think of this. John, at one point in his ministry with Jesus, uh, gets himself into a little bit of trouble. He and his brother get upset because there's a town that's rejected Jesus. And they say, God, let us call thunder down let us call lightning down on these on this town and destroy them and jesus rebukes them and ultimately gives them a nickname i think that sticks with them for quite a while he calls them the sons of thunder most likely because of this moment but i think john had to learn like all of us how to love people even those that have rejected us even those that have basically not treated us as well as we'd like and that's what this choice is all about a choice to love 
no matter what, a choice to love even in the face of difficulty or circumstances we can't understand, a choice to love those that maybe aren't very lovable because God loves them. And that's what John is challenging us to do. That's what walking and living in the light is all about, living in love and not walking in the darkness or anger or hatred or anything else. Okay, so let's look at this next passage here. 1 John chapter 2, 12 through 14. Now, this, this, uh, this portion of this passage or this chapter is often indented because of its rhythmic repetition and poetic feel. Um, it kind of reads like a little bit of an aside, like John's just saying, hey guys, stick with me because this is important. And so he kind of puts this, this very poetic little um, statement that has a lot of truth in it, into it. And it starts in 12. I'm writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. He's reminding us of some very important things. Don't forget this. In all of our study, in all of our learning, in all of our truth, it comes down to one of the most important things we can know that Jesus has forgiven us. 13, I'm writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. Again, what's most important? Knowing Jesus who is the life. I'm writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won your battle with the evil one. I have written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I've written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. A repeat of something he just said. I've written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. Um, I guess the main thing to take away from this, from, for this portion of what we're going to study today is there's three different levels of growth that are identified here. We have children, we have young or young ones, and then we have the mature in faith. And I think this is what I take from this. Where am I at in this process? Am I at the appropriate level of growth? Have I grown in maturity, in my understanding of who God is? Has my relationship with Him deepened? And of course, John's giving us some great foundational truth that we need to remember, that Jesus existed from the beginning, that He forgives us, and that there's battles to be won through God's Word living in our hearts. So, powerful stuff there, but let's continue. Verses 15 through 17, where John's going to talk about not loving the world. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Hmm. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So, um, I like this because it talks about three specifics, but worldliness is not merely about external activities. I think a lot of times we think of worldliness or sin, it's often about our associations, who we hang out with, where we go, uh, what we're doing. But here, John is addressing the attitude of our heart. He's not just talking about what we do, he's talking about what we think and what our emotions are like and what, what's going on inside of our mind. He's saying craving for physical pleasure or the lust of our flesh, the lust of our body, craving for everything we see, materialism, wanting more, greed. He's talking about pride in our achievements or possessions, the pride of life, seeking status. And it's interesting to note that these three things line up exactly with the temptations that Jesus faced in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus had to address each of these things when Satan tempted him in these very same areas. So what is Paul saying? Worldliness is not just about what we do. It's also about our thoughts. And we need to walk in victory by doing what pleases God. And if you do that, if you say no to these temptations, if you're able to love God more than you love anything else, more than you love the world, then you will experience this everlasting life that he's described is found in Jesus. All right, let's keep going. Uh, talking about the Antichrist. So 1 John chapter 2, 18 and 19 says this, Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. These people left our churches, but they never really belonged to us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong with us. Now, I mentioned at the start of this that there were a lot of heresies that were coming into the church, Greek philosophy and some other things that kind of infiltrated the early church. And obviously, once the truth exposed those people for what they were, they left. They didn't want to be a part 
of really surrendering their life to Christ. And I don't know if you can identify with that, but after you've walked with the Lord for a little bit of time, you might experience a time or two where someone's left. Someone that you loved, someone that you cared about, but they didn't have that stick to They didn't have the faith to remain. And John's saying, hey, don't worry. You know, those, those people never belonged with us. They didn't believe with us because they were of the Antichrist. Now, this is interesting because I think a lot of times when we hear Antichrist, especially now with our modern movies, all this amazing stuff that talks about the end times, we picture someone who is the ultimate evil, like a supreme evil leader, like maybe a dictator like Hitler or Stalin who killed millions of people. But that's not what John's talking about here. The Antichrist, this word, first of all, it only appears in the writings of John, which is interesting, but it is described and found throughout the Bible, like in the book of Daniel or the book of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Now, when he's talking about the Antichrist, he's talking about not the opposite of Jesus, but just another option. And that's exactly what the world wants us to do. It's not that they're trying to get us to outright reject Jesus. It's that they just want us to choose something else, anything else. But Jesus. That's what the devil wants to tempt us to do. That's what this Antichrist is talking about. It's talking about the temptation to choose anything other than the truth, the life, the light that is found only in Jesus. I don't know about you guys, but when I uh, was raised in the church as a young boy, I grew up wanting to be in ministry. And in my teenage years, I never came to a point where I said, I'm done with God. I'm going to go serve the devil. But I definitely made choices small compromises that took me further and further and further away from God. And that's what John's talking about throughout this passage. He's saying, don't allow any of those compromises, those little things to take you away from the truth, from knowing and walking in close fellowship with God. Confess your sins. Get those things out of the way so there's no distance created and there's no compromise that takes you off course and makes you into something you never wanted to be. And that's how I found myself at 27, 26 years old in a place I never thought I would be, totally away from God, totally blind and lost without any understanding of what God wanted to do in my life. And I finally came to a point where I was ready again to surrender and allow Jesus to come in and bring the life-giving relationship that he offers us all. And that is available to us. And that's what John's talking about here. Let's keep going for this last part. This is really important. Verses 20 and 23 through 23. But you're not like that. For the Holy One has given you His Spirit, and all of you know the truth. So he's saying you're not like those who have left the church. You're not like those who have embraced Antichrist or any compromise that's taken you away from Jesus. You're not like that because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. So I'm writing to you. This is verse 21. I'm writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. And who's a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. Anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either. But anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Again, people who are very religious, people who are trying to um, you know, be spiritual, are trying to say you can do that without Jesus. Jesus didn't really exist. He's just a representation of God. All those lies that were coming in, he's saying, no, no, no. It's all about Jesus. If we don't have him, we have nothing. If we don't embrace his sacrifice, his death on the cross, then we don't get saved. And this is this. This is powerful. We have the Spirit of God living inside of us. If we embrace Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence within us. He has given us his Spirit so that we can know when we're drifting away. We can know when there's a slight compromise in our life that needs to be addressed and confessed. We can know because God's Spirit now lives inside of us in this close fellowship, this abiding friendship that John has been describing all throughout the book. Now, his conclusion for our passage today, which we're going to end on 24 and 25. Gavin will pick up 26 and go through chapter 3 with you uh, on the next video. But this one, 24... So you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. And in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life He promised us. This entire passage has been about fellowship with the Holy Spirit, with God. A relationship that can change everything about your life that can fill you with the purpose, the life abundant, the joy, the truth that you've longed for. And John is inviting you to know the same man that he walked the earth with. 
He's saying you can have that same relationship. You can experience it too. All it takes is embracing the truth, believing in his son, believing in Jesus, and loving each other. I want to challenge you to do that today. Find a way that you can share the gospel with someone today and love the people around you well. Love them as the Lord loves them. Don't allow anything to enter your heart that would take you away from that love, from that joy, from that truth. Make sure you keep a short account, as they say. Don't allow things to linger, but bring it to the Lord right away and say, God, get this out of my life because I don't ever want to walk in a distance from you. That's what John's inviting us to, a close walk, a close friendship with Jesus. I pray this passage has blessed you and that you continue to get a lot out of the daily growth book as we continue to study it. We're going through 1 John this month. It's amazing. I um, also want to encourage you guys, if you enjoyed some of the things that I shared, a lot of that came from the Enduring Word Commentary, as well as the Life Application Study Bible. These things are great resources. I also have a Thompson Chain Bible, but just giving you a few resources and tools to get a lot out of these scriptures because they are so rich, so full of truth, and it's not just information, it's life transformation. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you in our next weekly overview.